Okay, uh, we can get started. Um, so uh, today it is a pleasure to introduce uh, Luis Felipe Rodriguez. Uh, Luis Felipe obtained his bachelor's degree in physics from the Faculty of Sciences uh, from UNAM, and then his PhD in astronomy from the University of Harvard. He is recognized as, uh, as the initiator of radio astronomy in Mexico. And uh, he, he was one of the founders of the Institute of Radio Astronomy and Astrophysics, where we uh, currently work. Um, so some of his research uh, topics include uh, star formation, um, galactic uh, X-ray sources, uh, protoplanetary disks, uh, Herbic arrow objects, uh, quasars, etc. And he has received uh, numerous awards, including the Robert Trumpler uh, Prize from the uh, Astronomical Society of the Pacific, the Bruno Rossi Prize from the American Astro Astronomical Society, um, the, the, uh, the TUAS Prize from the, the World Acad Academy of Sciences, and the Premio Universidad Nacional, and he is an elected foreign member of the National Academy of Sciences uh, of the USA. Uh, in, total, in, in 2010, he was made Emeritus Researcher, uh, as, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, Dr. Honoris Causa by uh, UNAM. And he's also a member of the Colegio Nacional. Um, and today he will tell us about uh, a pinwheel. Uh, what was it? Uh, a, a pinwheel uh, associated with WR147. So, uh, uh, so please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Vicente. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, indeed, uh, this uh, afternoon, I'm going to talk about a, a, a special world radiated star. I will explain you what are those stars that shows uh, in the radio waves, shows a very interesting structure that uh, I will explain how it uh, gets formed and what information does it have on the, on the star. So uh, let me move to my presentation in here. Um, I don't know, can you see it? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, let me see, uh, something is... Okay, here it is. Uh, so th this is work that I did uh, last year uh, in collaboration with several members of the IDEA, Jane Arthur, Carlos Carrasco and Jesus Tuala. And also uh, collaborated Gabriela Montes. Uh, you may remember her, she, she was into astronomy, but she, she moved and this is going to be probably her last paper, I understand. And it was published in the Astrophysical Journal. Now, one of the challenges, if I have to give the, the talk in the Spanish is how, how you translate pinwheel. Well, a pinwheel is one of these toys in which you have like, a, it looks like a windmill that has a pin in the center. And if you have a wind, this pin will, will rotate. And the structure has a similarity with the pin wheel, but it's not easy to translate pin wheel to Spanish. Apparently the closest word is reilete or reguilete, as we say in Mexico, but well, this is, a, uh, the, the morphology of the structure I will be describing. Well, let's start with what are the, the world radiated stars. These are very interesting stars. They were discovered in the late uh, 19th century by two French astronomers, of, of course, Wolf and Rayet. And in their honor, the stars are known as world radiated stars. They are very interesting. They are very luminous, massive stars that are, have left the main sequence and have lost a lot of their atmosphere, their hydrogen atmosphere. So uh, one sees in the spectrum and in the wind, uh, the presence of heavier elements like helium, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. They are actually, the, of the stars in, in uh, the, let's say the stars known, they are the ones that have the most powerful winds and they are, they are very luminous. And uh, they are in the last stages of a high mass star and are supposed to become supernova sometime in the future. Now, the WR147 
is, uh, is its classification is, is important here is a WN. In here, the W means word rayet, and the N means that its wing is reaching nitrogen uh, lines. And uh, it has a, a type of eight, late type. It has a companion that is OB type. It's not clear what's the type of the companion. I will show you how they are distributed in the sky. It is relatively close at 630 parsecs. And it's very luminous. It has 2 million solar luminosities. There are few stars in the galaxy that have that luminosity. Well, this is a complicated graph, but don't pay too much attention. Just look at the first line. And the first line uh, is, uh, this is a, a schematic evolution of massive stars. And the first line is for the most massive stars the stars that initially have, let's say 60 solar masses or more. Well, they go through an evolutionary sequence um, that where you know, they develop very powerful winds. But let me just go to the last stage in that sequence where they are WN late, uh, the L means late type. So WR 147 is formed part of that class. So all this means that originally it was a very massive star. It has lost a lot of mass in powerful winds, but it still is pretty massive. The estimate of its present day mass is like 30 solar masses. And it's supposed to become a supernova type 2N in the near future. As you, you recall type two, it means that it is a single star supernova. Type one supernova, are binaries. The type two are single stars that collapse and, uh, and form the supernova. So this is, a, this is an interesting star, probably pretty unique in the galaxy. And, uh, and, and we got interested in, in it by the following. It turns out to be that some 20 years ago, Tudhill and his collaborators were studying another, uh, another world radiant star that has the number 104. This is a carbon rich world radiant star and, and there is a spectral type. And they found something very interesting for the first time. They found that when they took images in the near infrared with very high angular resolution, for this they use uh, the Keck One telescope in Hawaii and a technique of maximum entropy reconstruction. And, and they saw that, well, they could see the star, but then there was this uh, spiral, one arm spiral sort of coming out of the, of the star. So in this figure on the left uh, column, you have the wavelength, 1.65 microns. On the right is 2.27 microns. These are two colors of the near infrared. And, and then the top line, is April 1998 and the bottom line is June 1998, a few months later. And you will agree with me that the spiral has rotated in this, in this uh, few months. And from that you can calculate how long does it take for the spiral to complete a turn. Okay, well, wh what is creating these uh, interesting structures? Well, Tuttle came with a model that is still is believed to be correct. The idea is that you have a binary system in which one of the stars is a world radiant star with a very powerful wind. And here you can see in the figure from the Tuthill paper that you have in here the world radiant star with this very powerful wind. And it has as a companion, as a companion an OB star. OB stars also have powerful winds, but uh, not in orders of magnitude less than the world by the other stars. So what happens is that the two winds collide, the wind from the world by the other star and from the OB star, and a bow shock is formed, a shock front, where uh, the gas is compressed. And uh, in this case, the world by yet is carbon rich, and apparently, in this shock front or a little later, 
conditions are good to form dust. The, uh, the images I show you in the previous slide were near infrared images of dust emission. So what happens is that then, since the wind of the world radiator star is more powerful, the bow shock bends in the, in the, in the direction of, of the wind of the world radiator star. And if the binary system were not rotating, we will form a, a plume of gas and dust. But it is a binary system, it is rotating. And then this makes that the plume that is going in a straight line, as time goes by, it, it is ejected in different angles and it forms, it gives the impression of a one-armed spiral. In, in, this, in, in, this, in these sources, when the world radiator is carbon rich, what you see is hot dust that somehow form in the shock or after the shock. Well, it, uh, to, to uh, fix this idea in you, well, it's the same effect that we see in one of these sprinklers that you, you may have seen in gardens, right? The water is of course moving uh, ballistically, but then since the ejector of water is rotating, you form this one, uh, one you form these spirals. In the case of a sprinkler, it's a two-arm spiral. In the case of the world where you binaries, since the wind of the world where you dominate, you end having a one-armed spiral. Now, interestingly, these dust pinwheels were expected only in world radiant uh, uh, stars that are rich in carbon. Why is this? Because dust is believed to be uh, in, in good uh, in good amount of carbon, graphite, and things like that. So uh, people said, well, uh, this is structure is seen uh, in worth uh, carbon rich world radiant stars. But in, for example, in a nitrogen rich world radiant star, you wouldn't expect to see these dust spirals. And over the years, a handful of cases have been detected in the infrared, and indeed all are uh, the world radiant star is carbon rich. That seems to be a condition to create the dust, uh, the dust spirals. Now, um, uh, some years ago, we took this uh, new VLA data of the star. The star is very interesting in the radio and in the optical. This is a, an optical image at eight gigahertz made with the VLA of the older BLA. Now it is much more sensitive. So in here, what we have is we see there are two sources. The southern source is where the world radiant star is. And the radio emission that we see in here is uh, comes from the wind of the world radiant star that is ionized and emits free free radiation. And, and it forms it forms like a radio photosphere. It looks like a big object. Uh, it's not a real physical object, but it's just the fact that the free free is, has opacity in the radio and you get a, like a false radio photosphere. Now uh, to the north, this asterisk marks the position of the other star. And just a little bit to the south of the northern star, you get, you, you form the bow shock. And so, in here we're seeing two things, the wind of the world radiant star to the south and the bow shock between the world radiant and the OB star. The OB star actually is not detected. What we detect is the bow shock between the two uh, stars. And it's very interesting in here, uh, I don't know the science changing here, but the, the spectral index of this source goes at frequency to the 0 0.6. That is, it rises, the flux density rises with frequency because it is a thermal wind source. And to the north, it goes in the other direction. The uh, spectral index is negative. So the flux decreases with uh, increasing frequency. And th this is the characteristic uh, signature of optically thin synchrotron. So in here you have in a, in a, in a single image, you have the two uh, main processes uh, of continuum emission in the radio. 
free free to the south and synchrotron to the north. In the uh, in the image we did back in uh, 1999, um, we actually saw some things to the south. These are two positions, but we really didn't know what they were. Now, in retrospective, we realized that they were probably part of the spiral that we saw in the most recent data. So let me go to uh, the most recent data. This data is taken at 15 gigahertz, at a somewhat higher frequency than the previous image. And in here in this black and white image, I'm just showing the brightest parts of the image to the south, the wind of the world radio star, to the north, the bow shock between the winds of the two stars. Now in those 20 years, uh, the VLA increased its sensitivity enormously. How did they do this? Well, basically by uh, in, in until let's say 2010, the bandwidth for a continuum were very narrow, let's say 100 megahertz. And now they are using bandwidths that are 4,000 megahertz, 40 times wider. So that this means that if you're doing a continuum observation, now you are much more sensitive and you can see fainter things. And this is what is uh, uh, shown in this graph in the horizontal axis is the frequency of observation and in the uh, vertical is the noise and the red points were the noise of the old uh, BLA and now the new uh, so-called Jansky BLA, you know, is 10 times better the sensitivity. So indeed in these images, once you start playing with the contrast and, and you start trying to bring up the fainter image, you realize that there is something else besides the two main sources. And, and that something else seems to have the shape of a spiral. So uh, when we saw this, we said, well, this looks like the spirals that have been seen in a handful of other world radio stars. But this is a WN. This one shouldn't produce dust. And indeed, this emission is not coming from dust. This is spiral, the emission mechanism is optically thin synchrotron. Um, we, we then, um, we, can, we can determine the spectral index of the sources. This is a color image. Again, the two dominant sources, the wind of WR147 and the bow shock. And then you see, you can see the, the spiral going, doing one turn, turn and a little more and then just becoming undetectable. Um, synchrotron emission is produced when you have relativistic electrons and a magnetic field. And in here, what is happening is that at the shock that is produced somewhere inside uh, this region, what this is telling us is that in here, you have in the south, you have not only the world yet star, but you must have another star with a wind so that the winds interact and form a bow shock. And in this bow shock, you, you, you will not be able to form dust because there is not car, much carbon, but you will be able to do form a relativistic electrons and they will emit a synchrotron sources. And then the, the gas flows away, right? But as the binary rotates, you get the spiral, you get the spiral shape. And this is another way of looking at the data. It's a contour image. And in here, what we did is we did a contour image to be able to get the position of the peaks in the, in this, in the spiral. And why, why did we do this? Because we wanted to know what type of a spiral was this. So what you do is that you measure the positions and then you put them in a plot in which you have in the horizontal axis, you have the position angle of the knot and in the vertical, the radius to the star. And in here, what we see is that this is a, gives you more or less a straight line. And what does that mean? It means that we're dealing with the simplest 
of the spiral shape, the so-called Archimedean spiral, in which the radius of the knot equals the position angle times a constant. And it's just that because the, the gas is flowing at constant velocity, but as the binary rotates, is being ejected in different angles. So you can actually fit the data with this equation, a constant plus another constant that multiplies the position angle. Now, um, one first thing that you can get from this is that if the spiral is moving away at the wind speed, which is the reasonable thing to believe that all this is being carried away with the wind of the world right yet to start. And that wind has a velocity of, of uh, close to a thousand kilometers per second. And then from that, and just measuring the separation between two loops of the spiral, uh, once you think about it, you can get the period of the binary. And it turns out to be that the period is 1.7 years. That's a, that's a pretty short period. And since we know the mass of the world by the star, we can assume that there is a companion with a smaller mass. And we assume that the binary uh, has a total so, uh, mass of some 30, uh, this is wrong, it should, should be solar masses. And from that and Kepler's law, we find that the, the binary should have a separation of only four AU. That is, that's a very close binary and it's going to be very hard to separate uh, uh, observationally. So this technique gives, uh, gives us this first information, the period and uh, the an estimate of the separation of the binary that is producing the, the spiral. Well, so, uh, so that means that actually there are at least three stars in the system, WR147, the dominant star with a tremendous stellar wind. Then the companion at about 4 AU that is not detected directly. Uh, and uh, we will talk a little more about that. And finally, the known OB star that is some 4,000 AU to the north of WR147. And that star can be seen in the optical. And we can also see a second bow shock that is produced between the wind of the world by the star and the wind of that other OB star. Let, let me go back to the figure and, and try to explain you a little more what I'm saying. In here uh, at, at the southern third, you have WR147. And to the north, a little to the north of the bow shock, you have the OB companion. Those stars are, have been known for many years. But then to produce the spiral, you need to put another star very close to WR147 to produce a bow shock that will produce the, the spiral. Um, well, uh, one thing that we considered doing was the following. In, in some systems, you have uh, two nearby stars with winds and you produce a bow shock in between the stars, right? And if the system is very compact, that bow shock is going to be very small and you can actually see, see it using very long baseline observations. And this is a case of another star Cygnus OB2 number five. This is not a world radio star, but it is a very luminous O star. And uh, say Hussib and Laurent and various collaborators, we did this observation some years ago and found that with very high angular resolution, you do see a little bow shock, right? Between the two stars. So you may say, hey, let's go and look for for that uh, bow shock in the case of WR147. Supposedly at very small scales, there should be a little bow shock from which the, the pin wheel emanates. Well, the problem is the following. In, in, in the case of this star, for example, the uh, separation between the star and the bow shock 
is known to be about uh, 30 astronomical units. And the problem is the following. This is uh, this uh, plotting here is the geometry of these other stars, Cygnus over two number fives. And what happens is that I, I told you that these winds uh, of ionized gas are actually become actually optically thick in the radio. And so you see a big object, which is not a real solid object or gaseous object. It's just the fact that the free free is pretty optically thick in the radio. So in the case of Cygnus OB2, apparently the photosphere, let's say, is this dashed line, okay? So what happens is that the star has an elliptical orbit and it goes inside the photosphere, the radio photosphere, and we don't see it. But then, you know, a few months later, it emerges and we can see it. So in here is very, it's a very nice case. That little bow shock, you only see that some epochs when the, the bow shock is outside this uh, radio, false radio photosphere. But in the case of WR147, we, th we think that we're not going to see this bow shock. Why? Because the estimated separation between WR147 and the close companion is only for a U. And the radio photosphere of W147, since the wind is so powerful, is huge. It has a radio of 35 astronomical units. So everything is happening inside the radio photosphere. So in principle, we will never be able to see this bow shock. And here is a plot of uh, how things could be happening. Uh, the red star here will be WR147. And then it has this wind that in the radio, you see as a big ball, right? Optically thick ball. And inside you have the other star, but you, you, you can't see any of these things simply because in the radio, you are uh, optically thick. Now, I don't know, some of these other radio photospheres are pretty clumpy and maybe there is a chance that there will be holes and you will be able to see the bow shock, but we haven't really tried this. So uh, indirectly, we can say that there are two stars separated by a short distance, a few astronomical units, and it's the interaction of the winds of those stars, the one that is producing the, uh, the pinwheel, the radio pinwheel. Now, let me, let me finish just say, saying a, a little of the physics of, uh, of the region, right? Uh, something interesting is that we know that this, the pinwheel is synchrotron. And uh, we can analyze well this little blob in here, which is brighter than the rest of the pinwheel. And in there, we can do the usual calculations one does for synchrotron emission assume equipartition of energy. And what we get is that in this ellipse in here, the gas has a magnetic field of five, of order five milligauss. And the electrons in there have a Lorentz factor, a gamma of 1200. Now, this means that they are very relativistic. It means that the velocity is 0.9999997 C. Well, you may ask how it is that in a wind that is only a thousand kilometers per second, you get to form uh, electrons that are, that are relativistic. Well, apparently this happens in the, in the shock. In the shock, you get a, 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 a acceleration mechanisms that are called Fermi acceleration mechanisms in which an electron can cross many times the bow shock and gain energy and then being very, very relativistic. No? So if we assume that uh, this blob in here is losing energy by the means of synchrotron emission, we can calculate the, uh, the uh, lifetime of the electrons and we get a thousand years. That is actually, that means that this blob, you know, can travel and survive for a long time. However, what we've seen here is that the 
a spiral, we, you stop seeing the spiral after a few years, right? So uh, probably something else is making you lose energy. There is a plot of the way uh, synchrotron radiation work, works. You have a magnetic field, right? And the relativistic electrons describe helixes and uh, emit radio waves. So, uh, th but this doesn't seem to be very efficient. Now, what may be happening, it may have to do with another mechanism of, of uh, emission. And that is that the high uh, speed electrons in, in this blob are actually getting a lot of radiation from the stars. And you, you have the process of inverse Compton cooling. That is the electron is going very fast, very close to the speed of light. And an optical photon comes in the way and it's heated by the electron and it becomes an X-ray or gamma ray uh, photon and the electron loses energy. That is the electrons give energy to the photons and transform the photons of the, of the star, which are ultraviolet, optical ultraviolet into gamma ray, into gamma ray uh, uh, photons. Now, when you do the calculation, uh, I mean, oh, my, my science changed, but I will tell you, uh, inverse Compton cooling seems to be more important than synchrotron. And when you make some uh, estimates, you come to the conclusion that uh, inverse Compton is going to uh, cool the relativistic electrons, that is, make them go slower in a scale of years. So that seems to be, seems to be more reasonable. So the idea is that uh, the radiation is decreasing by uh, probably by expansion of the gas and things like that, but also by inverse Compton cooling. The problem is that if you had inverse Compton cooling, you should produce some gamma rays. And people have calculated this and in principle that should be detected, but it has never been detected. For example, WR147 is known to be a double X-ray source. And that is probably coming from the shocks. The shock in here produces X-rays and the shock in here also produces X-rays, but no gamma ray emission has been reported. And well, and this is a, a research that, that is going on. Well, um, something interesting happened meanwhile, and it is that in 2019, a group led by Callingham reported a very unusual dust spiral. All these spirals I've been talking about, the handful of dust spirals and the one radio spiral can be fitted reasonably well with an Archimedean spiral. But these guys found a source that seems to be a, bi a binary of world rayet stars. It seems to have a carbon rich world rayet star and a nitrogen rich world rayet star. But then the spiral has a very unusual structure. It really looks uh, different to the other spirals. And let me describe you this, uh, what this figure in here has. In here in gray scale, we have the middle infrared emission at 8.9 microns from Vizier, one of the detectors. Uh, I, I think it's one of the BLT detectors. And uh, in here, as we, uh, as we make a blow up of this region, you find that in here, in here you have, again, the binary of world radiant stars and nearby an OB star. It looks, this is uh, repeats a lot, you know. You have a closed binary system and then an OB star nearby. And this, the, uh, the structure is coming from here. And the red contours are the radio continuum emission from the made with ATCA, the Australian 
uh, radio telescope array. So, so this is uh, pretty remarkable. And what they did was to say, to find an explanation in terms of saying that one or perhaps both of the, the world radio stars have a very anisotropic wind. Opposite to the other cases where supposedly you have an isotropic wind, in here the wind is collimated. And they actually managed to model and produce these shapes by making one of the winds to be collimated. Now, what makes they, this interesting, having a, a world fire star with a collimated wind? Well, because those stars that have a, a lot of rotation could be the progenitors of the famous long duration gamma ray burst. You, you probably recall that there was this phenomenon of the gamma ray burst and the, one of the types is the long duration lasts some seconds. And uh, the explanation is that the star is rotating so fast that it is uh, the explosion is not, uh, is not isotropic, but it comes, the ejection of material comes in two poles. And uh, if you happen to be aligned with one of those poles, you see something very bright and very energetic. And uh, the, the way of explaining this is proposing that the star has a lot of rotation. So to resume, this image uh, of this strange spiral implies, according to their interpretation, that the, uh, one of the two stars embedded in here has a collimated wind. And that means that that star probably will transform into a long duration gamma ray burst. It will end as a long duration gamma ray burst. And in here I have a figure, uh, an artist's uh, depiction of how these uh, stars explode, right? And uh, most of the gas and the radiation come in two beams. And that's why we see them to be apparently so, so bright. So this is interesting because this type uh, of, uh, of objects are very interesting. Now, of course, the problem is that when is this system going to become a long duration gamma ray burst? Well, probably in 10,000 years. So we will not be here to, to check this idea. But, but this is interesting. And people is trying to do research and try to confirm that indeed the stars are, one of the stars is rotating very fast. Well, uh, you, you note that this object was called by the discoverers a pep. W what is a pep? Well, uh, they thought it was uh, fun to use uh, the name of an Egyptian deity from the Egyptian mythology. And uh, this is a snake that is all curled around. That is the enemy of uh, Ra, the, the sun god that appears here as a cat. So they say, hey, this is cool. This is a, uh, this is a sun god Ra, which is a star, the sun. And this is the, uh, the spiral that is coming out. So I don't know how they managed to, to get the editor of nature to accept that name. I'm sure that if I propose a name like that, it will not be accepted, but, but they managed to convince the ed editor and the source is called Apep in honor of this uh, god of the Egyptian mythology. Well, let me finish just saying, what are we trying to do? Uh, uh, Jane, uh, Carlos, uh, we submitted a proposal trying to do a few things with the VLA. One straightforward thing is to verify the period of WR147, observing a few times with separation of months, we should see the spiral go around and we will get a, a true measurement of the period. Um, the other thing was an indirect measurement. We want to look for other synchrotron PUP in wheels in other nitrogen rich stars. But it, it's also worthwhile to look uh, for 
synchrotron on pinwheels in the carbon stars that both that they do not have a dust pinwheel or may have a pinwheel because the idea is that these carbon stars that have a dust pinwheel in that pinwheel there should also be relativistic electrons and they all should also should be synchrotron emission and so so this is kind of interesting uh, in other words a carbon star can produce a dust pinwheel, but can also produce a radio pinwheel, while a nitrogen rich world radiant cannot produce a dust spiral, only a radio, a radio spiral. And finally, well, let's hope that in, a, in some of these stars, a morphology similar to that of a PEP will show. It turns out to be that in practice, this is very difficult and the sources are far and difficult to do, but we're trying to learn a little more about this uh, phenomenon. So thank you very much and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, very nice talk. So we have a question from Gilberto. Hi Luis, uh, very, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, maybe it was my imagination, but I think in your uh, position angle versus distance plot, there, there was a systematic wiggle. Uh, could that be uh, because uh, an inclination in the, in the sky or maybe a non-circular orbit for the binary? What's, what's your thought about it? That, that's a very good question. Uh, we, we didn't really, but, but you're right. There seems to be like a, a, a sinusoidal si cycle. And I guess that you could probably, you could probably explain it. Uh, let me see. I, I, I have to look into that. You're right. That's an interesting point. And it, it will probably be what you said. Either the orbit is elliptical and that somehow changes the, the things or, uh, uh, or, or, or we have a, a, a an angle uh, problem, but to, to be realistic, I haven't looked into that and we, we should do it. And that's a very good question. Thank you. I think I can comment a little bit more about that if you- Yes, know. yes, go ahead. So you, we have, you have to think that this is a 3D spiral. It's not only a, like a plume. So it is actually the two winds interacting. So there's, there's like a, it's not a shell, but it's not a, a plume going about the stars. So it, it's very likely it, the, this thing has structure that we don't see like a straight line in the air. So it has some structure. Yeah, it's like a barrel or something like that. Yes. Uh -huh. so, yeah, right. But that's a very good point because, because the signal seems to be enough to say that there is a, 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 I mean, that there is a difference with a straight line. Uh -huh. But uh, but a three D structure that generates some kind of limb brightening or shadowing or things like that, it wouldn't change the distance with the position angle too much. Yes, right, right. I, I think that you're right that we should look into into that because uh, because it is it is certainly there and we choose to ignore it for the moment, but. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's something that should be explained. We, supposedly, we'll get much better data and we will be able to confirm the, the, the oscillation and, and do something. But yeah, we should look into that. We, we really haven't modeled things in detail. But yeah, but it's interesting because it, it will tell us things about the binary system. Okay. Um... So I also, I have a, are there any other questions? So I have a question as well. Um, so, uh, so well, this is not my topic, but I think it's a very nice, very nice result, very nice discovery. Uh, but I was wondering about uh, if, if this has, if this discovery has implications for other areas of astronomy, like for example, is it more likely to find uh, gamma ray bursts or, or, or something like that in uh, close to uh, one of these uh, pinwheel um, uh, uh, objects. Or, or well, that? Yeah, well, that, that's that's probably true. Um, 
or yeah, you, yeah. yeah because waiting for the <laughs> gamma ray burst to explode is a bad idea yeah but, right, uh, right yeah yeah but yeah but, but you're right yes you you could probably or at least or, if you or, have or, a or few or, or a pulsar or something like that. I, I, something I, I heard something about about uh, about a, a correlation like that, but I'm, I'm not I'm not sure. Like, like what, what you one could do is that I I think that people knows how many supernova are more or less spherical, and how many are collimated and, and produce a, a longer duration gamma ray burst. I, I don't remember the exact number, but I think it's like a hundred to one, right? Right, right, right. It's much yeah. common to have. So if you find too many of these APEP sources, that means that something is wrong. You should see much more normal uh, spirals than APEP-like uh, uh, sources. But yeah, that's something that one should, should try to do. And what you're saying is that in that region where they found APEP, maybe similar stars form in the past and have uh, exploded as, as a longer duration gamma ray burst. Now, of course, in our galaxy, we haven't seen a long duration gamma ray burst as far as I recall. All this is extragalactic. And it, it's very unlikely to see even a, a supernova, but a long duration gamma ray burst in our galaxy, it's, uh, it's very unlikely. And unless somebody corrects me, I think it hasn't been observed, but because it will be a supernova, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I got a bit confused, but I was wondering uh, if it's like one of these things is an, an indicator of, of uh, some other kind of object, but maybe I um, misheard something. OK, um, are there any other questions? Um, no. Well, uh, yes, a question. I just a final question. Uh, uh, I know I'm part of this paper, and I've been thinking a lot about this. Uh, do you think that dust will be intrinsically different than those around that those pinwheels around carbon-rich wolf-rayed stars? You you mean if we find a dust uh, spin a dust pinwheel in these objects? So so right now I was looking into the infrared photometry of the wolf ray the carbon-rich. Uh, Pinwheels and this color, and they look very similar. So this, uh, I was surprised because of I was expecting that the dust would be different. So, so mean, what, it looks like normal interstellar dust or something. No, like car carbon-rich dust around pin in pinwheels around carbon-rich wolf ray stars. Oh, okay. Well, that, that's a good question. Probably. I just I, I was just doing this at the same time that you were uh, giving your talk, so it is it surprised me a lot. I was expecting that the infrared SED will be different, thinking that it will be different dust species. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, that was, that, that's also very intriguing. Jane was very in, in, well intrigued about this. That here you have this tremendous shock, right? That probably hits everybody, hits everything, and sublimates everything. And then a little downstream, you have dust. So, so this is interesting. And also, it, it may have a cosmological implication. You know that uh, at the beginning of the, when the universe was very young, uh, it, it's hard to think how to create uh, dust. But once you have heavy elements, probably you will form binaries. And these binaries will collide and will produce dust. By, by a mechanism that you would think uh, the opposite. You would think this will destroy dust, but no, it actually apparently compresses so much the gas that then this gas, as it flies away, cools and forms uh, and forms dust. But yeah, all, all this is um, something that has to be researched. Thank you. Okay, um, any other questions? Um, okay, if not, let's let's thank uh, Luis Felipe again uh, for a very nice talk and uh, uh, see you everybody next week. <laughs>